Hi again, everybody. Welcome back if you've been with us and welcome here if you're just now tuning in. We're getting towards the end of our Super Science Saturday fun today, but we have a couple more cool things to show you. And this in particular, this is a little bit of an atmospheric adventure story that you're gonna hear now. And if you were with us earlier, and if you watched the um, Hide and Science, you might have noticed a special tool that one of the scientists used to find the other ones. It was a tool that measures carbon dioxide. And now you're gonna actually get to hear directly from that scientist, Britt Stevens, and he's gonna show a video and tell you a little bit more about that tool and how it's used and what it can tell us. Um, as we go along, as usual, if you have any questions, we love questions, so please enter them into the Zoom chat or the Q&A, and we'll have time to ask Britt some questions afterwards. There you go, Britt. Tell us what we're gonna, what we're gonna hear about. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, my name is Britt Stevens. I, I work in a uh, part of NCAR called the Research Aviation Facility. You may have just seen a tour um, of that facility. Uh, and I study carbon dioxide. As scientists, we're interested in carbon dioxide or CO2 um, because we're, we wanna know where it's coming from and where it's going to. And, and one of the ways we try and figure that out is by flying those airplanes up and down. And if, if there's more CO2 near the ground, we know that something's emitting it. And if there's less, we know something's taking it up. So that's a really common uh, scientific approach but it's pretty expensive flying those airplanes around. And we had an idea of a way to do it uh, for a lot less money, which is to bike a CO2 analyzer up and down the Mesa Hill. So we did that and we made a little video about it and that's what you're gonna see next. Uh, and I'll be around for questions afterwards uh, and you can type them into the chat during the show as well. Go ahead and take it away, Tiffany. Carbon dioxide is a gas. It's all around us. You can't see it, it's invisible. And there's only a, a small amount of it in the air, but it's really important because uh, it absorbs heat. And right now it's making the planet warmer because it's increasing. Carbon dioxide is a carbon and two oxygens, so it's written as CO2. So I usually just say CO2 for short. Um, it's invisible, but we've had instruments that can measure its concentration for about 70 years. Uh, and in the late 50s, measurements were started at a place called Mauna Loa in Hawaii, on the Big Island of Hawaii. So what I'm gonna do is draw a graph. The numbers on the left are showing the concentration of CO2 in parts per million of CO2. So I'll write a big PPM CO2 over here. And then on the, this axis over here is just the time or the date. So these are years. When those measurements were started, um, in the late 50s, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was around 315, 318 parts per million. So it was about right there. Um, and Dave Keeling, the person who started these measurements, found out after about a couple years that they were going up, but they weren't going up in a straight line. They were kind of wiggling. And so CO2 has been doing something like that ever since. And it started going up even faster. And by the time it got to Around 2000, it was in sort of the 380, 390 range. And then it crossed 400 right about 2016. And now we're right about 415 parts per million for the global average. The reason that CO2 concentration is going up is because we're burning all these fossil fuels in our cars and power plants. So those are fuels that were buried underground for millions of years. We've been measuring carbon dioxide uh, continuously at a place outside of Nederland, Colorado called Niwot Ridge. So this is at about 11,000 feet altitude. It was, we actually started those measurements in 2005. And if I plot those uh, on here, they are a lot noisier than, than the red curve. And what they actually do is they go lower during the summer and they go higher during the winter and lower during the summer and higher during the winter we became interested to see what it was uh, even closer to home. So we in installed an instrument here at the Mesa Lab, and that's been going since 2012. And what we found then was that CO2 was even more variable, and it went from about um, the same place as the others, but it went all the way up 
to 650 parts per million. Every, you know, every few days there's a spike that goes way up. And, um, and, the, and the reason it's more variable um, could be because there are people walking around the building, but it could also be because uh, there are more cars and, and uh, there's a, until recently, a coal burning power plant here in Boulder and, and other um, sources of CO2 around the, around the front range. So one thing we've noticed is that uh, in the middle of the morning, there's often a spike in CO2 here at the Mesa lab. And we've kind of wondered if that was because people were showing up to work late. Um, or driving around Boulder, or if it's because um, the, the way the air mixes, it just brings all the CO2 from down in Boulder to us. So we're gonna try and do some vertical profiles by biking up and down the hill um, with a CO2 analyzer to, uh, during the morning transition period, to get a better idea of what's causing CO2 at the Mesa Lab to vary. Okay, let's go get Tim to bike this CO2 analyzer up and down the hill a bunch of times. So this is the, bike CO2 analyzer. Um, Check that and, out. Yeah, it's uh, like uh, other instruments that we have at field stations or on airplanes, but it's smaller uh, and battery powered. So um, it's like a big lunchbox. Yeah, I, there's, I don't think you want to eat what's in here. And there's a little pump uh, and I think I can turn it on here. Um, you, you can hear the pump running and that sucks air in to the instrument. Um, uh, from a tube that uh, is out on the front of the bike. Oh, and, then, okay. and then the actual instrument, I can take the lid off and we can look inside. It's a little bit easier to tell what's going on. If you can see in here, there's two tubes, one going in and one coming out. So that, that pump's gonna suck the air in from outside and push it through these tubes. And on one end of this uh, gold colored uh, Cylinder? Cylinder, that's the word I'm looking for, is yeah. a lamp. Uh, so it's a little tiny, uh, almost like a light bulb that um, produces infrared radiation. And on the other side is a detector that um, can sense how much is there. So if there's more CO2 in between here, there would be less uh, infrared radiation oh. making it to the other end. So, so there's a signal, we measure the voltage and the voltage would go down when the CO2 goes up. Wow, that's pretty vice simple. Versa. So, uh, but we basically just turn this on and turn the pump on and it'll measure continuously the whole time you're going. We get a number every second. Uh, and it also measures pressure uh -huh. at the same time. And that's how we're gonna tell how high you are on the uh -huh. road um, because sea level pressure um, is um, around 100 kilopascals or 14.7 pounds per square inch. Okay. Um, up here, it's about 80% of that because we're we're really? 5,000 feet above sea level, so there's a lot less air above us. And there's actually a lot less air above us here at the NCAR Mesa Lab than there is down at the intersection of Broadway and Table Mesa. Yeah, the skies are pretty blue. Yeah. And there you go. And we're all set. Just like that. There you are. Thank you. Eighty point six kilopascals. So as they start going down, that that number will start going up. Some point on the way down that hill, CO two went way up. Maybe we should call Tim and find out where he is. Hello. Hey Tim. Hey. Where are you? Entering the school zone just past the church. So you you, you hit about four hundred and seventy five ppm. Um, and it was a pretty sharp transition, right about where you are now. It looks like. Oh, really? But did you feel like the air all of a sudden got clearer? It was definitely colder <laughs> here. We 
you're getting the occasional uptick. I don't know, maybe... Um... Our car just went by. Okay. Interesting, it went up to like 500. 500? And car CO2. Do, 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 do. Eh. Car CO2. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit noisier on the way up because those are the cars that went by and maybe a little bit of your breath, but you can see the kind of the baseline. I don't know this time if you go down there if it's going to go higher concentration of CO2 because there are more cars, people are commuting to work, or if it's going to go lower because the sun's up and it's heated the ground and caused more mixing to happen. So we don't know. Yeah, let's do it again. Turning around now, getting ready to come back up. Okay, we're actually on Table Mesa now. And a couple of cars are going by. Oh, that's not you right there, is it? You're at 419 now. There was, you were 440 for about two minutes on the way up there. So I don't think that was a truck. I think that was just a puff of the dirty boulder air. Oh, uh, okay. As you can see, it's so peaceful out here. <laughs> oh, an EV just went by, full electric. That was, that was a gas burning car and the electric car didn't do anything. But you know, if you ignore the spikes from the cars, the CO2 has been going down slowly as you've been climbing up. Bike number two was a success, and I managed to convince Tim and Riva to do it one more time. C-O-2. I'm so curious what it's gonna look like this time coming back up. What are we measuring? measured 420 at the bottom. Wait, 420 was below it? Which is what it is up here. So it's like this this slug of dirty air is moving up in like a, a layer. Oh. All right, great work everybody. Let's go back inside and see what we've got. Tim and Riva biked up and down the hill three times. And now we're gonna check out um, what we measured. What I'm showing here is a graph of carbon dioxide concentration as a profile, a vertical profile on the hill. Pressure goes up as you go down, and so the y-axis is in pressure and it's reversed, so lower values are up and higher values are down. So that, that makes it align with the real world, so you can kind of think of this graph as um, representing the NCAR Mesa Lab at the top left and then the intersection of Broadway and Table Mesa at the bottom right. Um, and then the x-axis is the carbon dioxide concentration. So concentration was almost constant all, most of the way down the hill. And then all of a sudden, right as they got near the bottom, it went shooting way up. So that's really cool. I think this is um, a result of all of the pollution that uh, builds up overnight in, in Boulder. Um, the air is usually pretty calm. All of the Burning of gas in cars and uh, burning of natural gas to heat homes produces CO2 that, that accumulates overnight. So let's see what we got when we um, compare all the profiles we did. And that's shown on this graph. So again, this is pressure on the y-axis and carbon dioxide on the x-axis. And the Mesa Lab is at the top left and the Broadway Table Mesa intersection is at the bottom right. This is really cool. So uh, we didn't measure the same thing every time. It changed a lot, but it, uh, I think it changed in ways that, um, that we can understand. So the, the very first time down and up are the red and the orange line, and they went, they went way up to about 460 parts per million. And on the way back up, the orange line, we saw some looks like little plumes of high CO2 on the way back up. The very next time that Tim and Riva went down were the green lines here, 
and carbon dioxide was actually higher kind of on the hill on the way down, but then when they got to the bottom of the hill, it, it didn't, the concentration didn't go up as much. I, I think what that is is the air is starting to mix, so it's, um, the sun is coming up and it's heating the surface and it's, it's making that air warmer and the warmer air wants to rise and so sort of slowly coming up the hill. And then they did it one more time. Uh, they were having so much fun, they wanted to go again at um, around 10.30 and those are the blue lines. And those are crazy. They, they, they saw really high CO2 concentrations on the way down the hill. And then when they got to the bottom, the concentration was actually even lower than before. So I think that they just happened to catch this big plume of uh, dirty boulder air that was uh, kind of wafting up the hill in the mid-morning. And that happens to be exactly the same time when we saw uh, some big spikes in the CO2 concentration in our measurements here at the Mesa Lab. And it's the same time when we usually see them. So, uh, I think it's pretty clear that the spikes we see up here in the mid-morning are a result of all this air that's accumulated overnight down low, getting sort of sucked up past the, past the Mesa Lab. So now we know why we get these big spikes of uh, CO2 up here at the Mesa Lab um, in, in sort of the mid to late morning. Um, and that's great. If we could only convince Tim and Riva to bike up and down the hill um, three or four times every day, we could really do a great uh, research project. Well, hi, again. hi, that was a cool adventure. I was thinking watching that, that, you know, I wonder if we probably could convince Tim and Reva to bike up and down that hill three or four times a day. It might not be that hard. I think you're right. You have to find <laughs> somebody to do their regular jobs for them. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that would be a pretty cool job. I mean, Britt, your job is pretty cool from from measuring gases like CO2 in airplanes to going out and watching what happens when people are on bikes. Your, your work is a good adventure, it looks like. Uh, well, it is nice to get out of the office and out from behind a computer screen every once in a while. The, um, yeah, the basic job is trying to figure out puzzles about uh, the Earth system. So I, I like that part too, even if it does involve sitting behind a computer. <laughs> No doubt about it. I have to know. I mean, would there be any difference with Tim if he's huffing and puffing? I mean, when we breathe out, we exhale carbon dioxide, right? Would he be messing up those numbers at all? Yeah, that's, we tried to put the tube way out front on the bike, um, like you could maybe see in the video, uh, so that as the wind was rushing past, uh, that wouldn't happen. And they were going downhill so fast that even if they went by a car, the, the numbers didn't really spike but uh tim and reva um you know super athlete human athletes that though they are they they don't bike uphill as fast as they bike downhill so um on the way back up here they were going slow enough that as the cars passed they got a big whiff of um exhaust and we might have seen their breath a few times but i think it was mostly the cars that is pretty cool it was so cool to get a real-time view of that we do have a few questions that are coming in, Britt. Um, some good questions. Violet is wondering who built the CO2 detector? Well, the box is something I put together, but the, uh, the, the sensor inside that you saw all the um, electronic boards and the lamp and the detector is a, is a commercial sensor. Um, and then it just has a bunch of custom stuff around it. So. The company that sells that um, sells them to scientists um, and also people with commercial greenhouses who really care about the CO2 and other industrial applications. Um, but uh, so the box um, and uh, all the pumps and the tubing and the battery and everything else, I, I kind of cobbled together um, the week before we were going to go ride. Cool. Well, and it was funny because Nicholas also said, well, if, if you built that, then could you make a jet pack? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I wish. Um, send, me, send me the instructions if you know how. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> we'll work on that. Um, there are a couple other questions in here. Uh, somebody's wondering what happened in the afternoon. All of this was done in the morning, right? 
Yeah, if you're watching really closely on that last graph, we plotted some purple lines from the afternoon. And that was that was a test run that I did uh, the day before. And when I got down, I actually started at the bottom and rode up and then came down afterwards. And, and at the, down at the intersection of Table Mesa and Broadway, that the CO2 concentration was actually lower than it was up here at the Mesa lab. And I think that's because of all the trees photosynthesizing uh, and taking up CO2 in the afternoon. Oh, yeah, that would make sense. Here's another one. Um, AJ is wondering, why didn't the electric vehicle show up when the other cars appeared on the graph? That's an interesting piece, huh? Yeah, electric cars are really cool. The only, the only thing they emit is water. Or wait, no, uh, I'm thinking of hydrogen cars. Back up, rewind. Um, <laughs> electric cars don't emit anything. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the electricity uh, may have come from a coal burning power plant that emitted CO2 far away. Um, but the um, but the cars it's driving is um, is not emitting anything unless the people have their windows down and are breathing hard. So just to clear up my mistake, um, a hydrogen car, which is something else you can buy and um, is good for the environment, um, produces water. Uh, but the cars that burn fossil fuels do it by taking the carbon and the fossil fuel and um, uh, combining it with oxygen to make CO2. And so CO2 comes out the tailpipe. And it's interesting that you mentioned fossil fuels. If anybody was with us for the fact or fib game earlier, um, we were discussing the meaning of the term fossil fuels. And actually, people couldn't be fueled. fueled. <laughs> I mean, fooled about that. <laughs> no pun no, intended. I, I voted for Jared's answer. But, um, <laughs> but I, was, I know. I was Not halfway. entirely untrue. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we've got some real science thinkers here this afternoon. We have another question coming in asking, would the number of plants or trees along the way affect the results or would it be about the same? I, I think they would. Uh, you know, we've done studies in forests in Wisconsin and studied tropical forests and uh, measurements out in the middle of the ocean. And, and sort of the lusher and greener the trees are, the more uh, rapidly they're taking up CO2. So in, in the middle of the afternoon over Wisconsin, you tend to see lower CO2 concentrations just because the forest is denser and there's more sort of uh, moisture for those trees. Out here, the trees are spread out further and it doesn't go down quite as much in the afternoon. We did a test with the, we had Tim bike right into the middle of a tree up here. It was kind of windy. Um, we didn't see much. So then we had him bike into the middle of, uh, they have something up here called the ozone garden, which is a bunch of plants that are sensitive to Ozone, and we saw CO2 go down by, I think, 10 or 20 parts per million in the middle of the clump of, of plants. Oh, interesting. That's a, that's a cool way to test that. Well, and there's one more question. This is, this is a little bit related to sort of the plants and trees question. Somebody's wondering, you know, we hear a lot about CO2, carbon dioxide these days, and global warming and climate change. And somebody's asking, does the CO2 that we breathe out actually contribute to global warming? Uh, that's a great question. Only if you had coal or oil for breakfast. So <laughs> it depends what you ate. Um, and the things people eat are, are tend to be either plants or animals that you know, ate plants. So the carbon that's in Cheerios that you have for breakfast came um, from a plant that grew quite recently, probably within the last year. Um, and when it grew, it took CO2 out of the atmosphere. And when you eat the Cheerios and you add oxygen to that CO2 and turn, or add oxygen to that carbon and turn it back into CO2 and breathe it out, you're completing a cycle and it's a cycle that happens really quickly. So within a year, the CO2 goes out of the air into the plant, into you and back out again. And cycles like that have been going on for thousands of years and are essentially in balance. So the concentration of CO2 never actually changes. It's only when we take something from out of this system that's naturally in balance and add it. So we take uh, fossil fuels that have been buried for millions of years and burn them, we add them, and that that has an effect of changing the concentration. So although we can measure CO2 from breath, it's not bad for the environment. And there are actually ways to measure isotopes of CO2 and tell the difference between uh, CO2 that's coming from fossil fuels or from people. 
Okay, so as long as my breakfast is like all of Chef Nancy's super science snacks with popcorn balls and marshmallows and, and snow crispies, then I'm good to go. I'm not, my, my, my yep. CO2 isn't contributing, huh? Yep, exactly. <laughs> okay, well, I don't see any other questions coming in. And I will say it's just about time to get ready for our grand finale. If anyone has joined us in previous years for Super Science Saturday, you know that the annual ping pong ball launch is always the big event at the end of our day. So, Britt, I know you want to get out there and watch yeah. that. So uh, everyone's getting set up, and we'll say goodbye to you, and thanks so much for, for sharing your experiment and your You're information. Welcome. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, that was a lot of fun. Thanks so much, and we will see everyone in a few minutes for the final event of Super Science Saturday.